But this evening we look at these verses in Isaiah 51, verse 12 to 16. And our theme this evening is the idolatry, unbelief and folly of the fear of man. The idolatry, unbelief and folly of the fear of man. The book of Isaiah naturally divides into two main sections. The first 39 chapters have to do with prophecies concerning events of Isaiah's own time. Uh, Thus you have Judah's uh, departure from the Lord in the first five chapters. Then what is sometimes called the book of Emmanuel in chapter 6 to 12 beginning with Isaiah's call in chapter 6 and the message is trust not in Assyria but in the Lord Jehovah who will provide salvation through Emmanuel the Lord Jesus who is to be God with us. Then you have judgments pronounced on the nations who oppose those who trust in the Lord. That takes you from chapter 13 right through to 24. Then the great hope of the remnant in chapters 25 to 27 and the woe to the wicked and hope for the righteous uh, in chapters 28 right on to 35. And then the blessing of those who trust in the Lord chapters 36 to 38 because they shall be delivered not only from Assyria but from death itself and then chapter 39 the Babylonian captivity is predicted as a punishment for lack of trust in the Lord and that's really the first main section then in chapter 40 up to chapter 66 we have prophecies based mainly on the future event of the Babylonian captivity. The captivity hadn't, uh, was yet to come and yet the prophecies are based upon it and speak of deliverance from it. So in chapters 40 to 57 you have the great Jehovah who will redeem his people through his anointed Cyrus he will deliver from Babylon through Cyrus who is called my servant because in the providence of God Cyrus was to be the instrument of uh, Judah being delivered from captivity but interspersed with prophecy of the Lord's deliverance of his people from uh, Babylon are those prophecies concerning the servant of the Lord that is our Lord Jesus Christ because although he was Emmanuel he took on the form of a servant the servant of Jehovah uh, who would deliver his people from spiritual bondage and you have uh, at several points in these chapters along with deliverance from Babylon being predicted uh, the uh, By the spirit of prophecy, Isaiah looks beyond that to the redemption that was to be accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in coming into this world to redeem his people from all iniquity. You have that in Isaiah 42, 1 to 7. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. It's also in chapter 49. 1 to 9 and in chapter 50 verse 4 to 9 and then at the end of chapter 52 and on into the well known uh, uh, chapter 53 you have this servant of the Lord this servant of Jehovah who is none other than the second person of the triune Jehovah who would be manifest in the flesh and who would be despised and rejected of men but who would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied so that's from chapter 40 on to 57 and then chapters 58 to 66 you have the glory of the redeemed Zion so our text appears in the midst 
of prophecy concerning deliverance from Babylon. Judah had trusted in Assyria and in Egypt and this was to bring the captivity in Babylon. And so therefore this prophecy of deliverance from Babylon contains a warning against that fear of man that had been so disastrous to them. There is a fear of man which is right and indeed is a duty that is a a respect for men uh, in authority. They are due that kind of fear and uh, the Apostle Paul uh, enjoins that kind of fear, that respect and uh, uh, humility before those who represent legitimate authority. And that kind of fear of man, of course, is entirely compatible with the fear of God. Indeed, it is a proper expression of the fear of God. But the fear condemned here is of a different sort. It is being afraid of man. Uh, being afraid of him uh, in a sinful way. First of all then, the idolatry of the fear of man. The idolatry of the fear of man. Verse 12, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? We see that the Lord speaks and he says, I, even I, or just simply, the word even is in italics, I, I. The comparison is clear. I, I am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? If God has given words of comfort, How dare we not be comforted? Who art thou, mere man, to set aside what I, the Lord, have said? Receiving God's comforting words is not only a privilege, but it is a duty. And uh, instead, they feared man. And in so doing, they were attributing to man what belongs to God. That's why the fear of man is idolatry, because it is ascribing to man what belongs to God. And the text says, Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? Now there, the word man is the word enosh, And you have that in Genesis chapter 4. This same word is used as a name in Genesis 4 and verse 26. And so Seth, to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, or in the margin Hebrew, Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. This stands in uh, marked contrast to the arrogance of Lamech, boasting of his self-sufficiency. But when godly Seth had a son, he called his name Enosh. Enosh means man, particularly in his weakness and in his feebleness and in his frailty. And uh, that's the word used in our text when it speaks of a man that shall die. It's used in Job chapter 7 verse 17. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment. There uh, there is a plea on account of man being frail and feeble and weak but then the next phrase or the son of man it's the son of Adam it's the word Adam 
which shall be made as grass, that is, which shall be withered like the grass, as in chapter 40, all flesh is grass, and the glory thereof as the flower uh, of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. So what, who art thou that thou shouldst be afraid of man, a man, Enosh, man in his frailty, a man that shall die, or of the son of man, Adam, who shall be made as the grass. The one term refers to man's frailty, and the other takes us to the cause of that particular frailty that man has created uh, Adam and yet fallen and therefore he shall be made as the grass to fear man we attribute to him what he does not have and what belongs to God because when we fear man we are attributing ultimate control of our circumstances to man as if our times were in the hand of man and not God whereas if the uh, word of uh, the faith once delivered to the saints speaks on this wise it says uh, my times are in thy hand but the fear of man is saying the opposite it's saying that our times are not in the hands of God they are in the hands of man so it is deifying man as if omnipotence were his rather than the truth that power belongeth unto God when the serpent tempted Eve and said ye shall be as gods we've seen many many times that all sins are comprised or the germ of them is found in that one sin man desiring to be as God and uh, because of our sin we are both proud and yet fearful on account of unbelief and so we alternate don't we between applying that lie ye shall be as gods to ourselves and then to others we apply it to ourselves by our selfishness and our excessive self love living for ourselves for our own aggrandizement and yet because uh, we feel the fear of man we attribute it also to other men as if they were God so we live in one sense as though we were God in our self-centeredness and yet we live as if other men were gods in our fearfulness and so the natural man he, he hovers between this self-worship and this idolization of other men he loves himself but he fears others and so his life is lived on this horizontal plane of self-love, self-centeredness and yet the fear of other man, men. He gives the love that belongs to God to himself and the dread that belongs to God to other men. The idolatry of the fear of man but then secondly the unbelief of the fear of man the unbelief of the fear of man verse 13 and 14 and forget us the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared, has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy and where is the fury of the oppressor the captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed and that he should not die in the pit nor that his bread should fail the unbelief of the fear of man to idolize man by fearing man we must needs forget the Lord these two go together we cannot think rightly of the Lord and fear man and we cannot fear man without forgetting the Lord 
unbelief lies behind every sin and this sin of the fear of man is no exception Uh, the Lord through Isaiah warned continually of this uh, in chapter 30 woe to the rebellious children saith the Lord that take counsel but not of me and that cover with a covering but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. In chapter 31 verse 1 Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel neither seek the Lord. And so there are many of these warnings in Isaiah. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils for wherein is he to be accounted of? They were forgetting the law, or they were in danger of it, and they warned against doing it again. Forgetting the power of the Lord in creation. Verse 13, And forget us the Lord thy maker. There it may be not only their creator, but also the one who in his grace formed Israel to be his people, to show forth his praise. That that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, the creator of the physical world. And having forgotten him, well, of course, they feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy. When they forgot the Lord, they were afraid of the oppressor. They were afraid continually and every day those who have no faith in Christ at all, they live perpetually in such fears. And uh, even the godly, because of their remaining corruption and unbelief, uh, they are subject to such fear. But he says, where is the fury of the oppressor? The Lord had taken it away. The Lord was going to deliver them. As we were singing in that psalm, we feared where no fear was. Is God not more powerful to preserve than the oppressor is to destroy? We rightly decry against the theory of evolution as a doctrine, uh, uh, as, as contradicting the truth of God, the Creator. But we don't need to espouse the lie of evolution in order to deny the creatorhood of God we do it every time we are guilty of the fear of man we treat God as if he wasn't the creator of the heavens and the earth as if he did not stretch forth the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth because if God did these things and he did then we can, can have confidence in him and we ought to have confidence in him and our unbelief of his power and of his care and of his knowledge and of his faithfulness these things are a denial that God is as he is evidently made known to be in the work of his own hands and thus in uh, verse 14 Judah is pictured as a prisoner in a prison or a pit and yet now able to run out of the prison and out of the pit with provision, bread that should not fail for the future and this uh, it would seem is saying that at the appointed time Judah will go free without hindrance and the Lord will follow Judah with kindness and provision like a prisoner released out of the prison and Uh, the provision of bread does not fail so at the appointed time the Lord who governs the nations would set Judah free from captivity he would be able to run forth 
and the provision of bread, sustenance, all that was needful, would not fail. And then they were forgetting the history of the church in verse 15. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared, the Lord of hosts is his name. I am the Lord thy God, that is, the God of the covenant, the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus, and the covenant God in his mercy to his people caused the Red Sea's waves to roar as they were driven back. Deliverance from Egypt was not just a picture of redemption. It was a manifestation of God's grace in the covenant. Because he was their God, he parted the Red Sea and delivered them from their enemy. And the God of redemptive power, can he not deal with the oppressor? They had so often been reduced to trying to in with the right people Israel was constantly trying to work out who they should be in alliance with who, is, who were they afraid of should they try and keep in with Assyria or should they try and make an alliance with Egypt in case Assyria comes against them and they were trying to work out the safe thing to do. And they were always wrong. Because their alliances, their whole idea was wrong. Because the Lord tells them to trust in him. And all their political maneuverings came to nothing. And worse than nothing. But do we not often do the same, personally? Fearing man, trusting in man? Is it not possible for life just to become a series of trying to preserve ourselves by making sure we don't offend this person, making sure we keep friends with this one, playing off this one against this one? How incompatible with faith in the Lord. And yet, is it not true that many lives are spent in nothing else? We can see it, as it were, plainly and largely in the political scene, the international political scene and national politics. But the same thing happens in miniature in many, many individual lives. Men and women's whole lives dominated, never rising up to God, but dominated, making sure they're friends with the right people, making sure they're seen with the right people, making sure they don't upset the powerful people who can do them harm and so it goes on and their lives are spent until they go down to the grave but then thirdly the foolishness of the fear of man the foolishness of the fear of man verse 16 and I have put my words in thy mouth and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion thou art my people sin is always foolishness sin is always bad for us sin is always contrary to our best interests so it is with the fear of man he says I have put my words in thy mouth now that is true of Israel generally when the Spirit of God 
was to be poured out, for example in Isaiah 59, 21, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. It was especially true of the prophets that the Lord put his word into their mouths and through them into the mouths of the rest of the church of God. But this is ultimately true of Christ himself, the church's head and representative, the one seed in whom all the elect seed were blessed. God spoke in these last days by his Son, the servant of the Lord, referred to in Isaiah. So he would put his word particularly into the mouth of the one, the Lord Jesus. Those things which he had seen of the Father, those, he, those words that he heard of the Father, they, they, these are the words that he spoke. And uh, he says, And I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, indicating protection and safety under the shadow of God's hand. But then we have this phrase, and I have, uh, That I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. Now, that, that, as far as the creation is concerned, God had already done that. So this must refer to the new creation being brought in at the completion of the application of redemption, the redemption accomplished by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Isaiah elsewhere speaks of the new heavens and uh, the new earth. You'll see in verse 6, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And then elsewhere he speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. So this is speaking of the new creation that comes about through the redeeming work of Christ being applied to the elect of God in regeneration and the bestowment of all the blessings of salvation culminating at the last day in the resurrection of the body and the renovation of the cursed creation. And say unto Zion, that is, the church of God, Thou art my people. Through the covenant of grace in Christ, God says to his people, Thou art my people. As we've seen many times, the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, uh, says uh, to the women, uh, to Mary, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In Christ, this God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the God of those who are in Christ. They are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And this is saying that the Lord will accomplish his saving purposes, that his plan will not falter nor fail, nor uh, be derailed in any way, and that he will uh, fulfill his purpose of mercy toward his people, that he will be their God in Christ Jesus, and he will bestow upon them all the blessings Christ has purchased for them, even to the new heavens and the new earth. As we've seen recently in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That is the ultimate goal and fulfilment of this word of promise and say unto Zion thou art my people and that means ultimately the new heavens, the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness that perfecting of the bond of the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus and they shall be his people and God himself shall be their God. What application are we to make of this? First of all, let us bewail and confess to God our dreadful unbelief as evidenced in our fear of man. As professing Christians, we profess to be loved with an everlasting love, that Christ died to redeem us, that Almighty God in heaven is our God, that he has pledged himself to us in the bonds of an everlasting covenant that he will be our God forever and ever that he will guide us even unto death and afterwards receive us to glory that he will raise our bodies at the last day that he will give us an eternal inheritance a new heavens, a new earth that he will be our God forever in a glorious world when we are conformed to the image of Christ's glory and yet we fear man. So we ought to confess the sinfulness of our fear of man. And then secondly, we ought to lay hold of his comforts. Ah, even I am he that comforteth you. Who art thou? that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die. If we're Christians, then the comforts of God's word are, are belong to us. Don't make a virtue of being without them. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? There is no virtue in unbelief. If there is joy and peace in believing, then there is no virtue in being without joy and peace because of unbelieving. So then, let us bewail our unbelief and seek to lay hold of all of the exceeding great and precious promises and live as before the face of God and with confidence in him and let us not fear what man can do.